Thank you very much, presiding officer. I think that what we have to distinguish, I think, is between principle and practicality. And I don't think the principle of supporting and assisting the most vulnerable in our society is at question here. And I think we've seen the Scottish Government take steps in those directions. The question has always been around practicality and effect. Now, the amendment that has been laid today um, and prior to today, the, I don't think anybody had had any sight of that amendment, although perhaps others did, um, will perhaps give the ability to do what the Labour Party uh, is suggesting. But the spice paper which Jackie Bailey quotes contains two important caveats. The first caveat is it first of all states if tax credits are accepted as a benefit. And at the moment, tax credits are administered through HMRC, not DWP. So there would need to be a discussion had around whether those would then be able to be classified as a benefit within the terms of the devolution settlement. But if the amendment that is put forward today allows for that to happen, we can take that as read. But the second important caveat, and I think this is a very critical one, is that top up of benefit is only possible where benefit is being received. And in the changes that are being proposed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, a significant number of people will lose all entitlement to tax credits. They will not receive any tax credit whatsoever. And the, the question mark there is whether you could use a top-up power. Well, you couldn't use a top-up power to top up a non-existent benefit. The question therein arises, how then do you administer a system which enables those people who do not receive tax credits as a result of a change in 2016 to subsequently receive them? And given that the powers that are being proposed in the Scotland Bill are, like, are, are at the very earliest going to come into play in 2017, possibly 2018, possibly later, depending on the technicalities of disaggregating some of the functions, particularly in areas of shared competence. That leaves a significant gap in terms of time for those families, those individuals who are going to lose out. So I think the Cabinet Secretary is entirely correct when he says that the important thing here is to look very carefully at the detail and then look at the possibilities that arise as a result of that. Because first of all, we don't yet know the final picture. We don't yet know finally what the Chancellor of the Exchequer is going to propose. He has been given a bloody nose by the House of Lords, and I'm no fan of the House of Lords, but I welcome the decision they took. It doesn't make me uh, think, that, uh, think any less that the place should be abolished because it is a democratic and constitutional anachronism. But, you know, a stopped clock is right at least twice a day, so uh, there's no reason why the House of Lords can't occasionally get a decision right either. But he has been sent home to think again by the House of Lords. If I could just articulate this point, and, and then I'll come back to the member. He has been sent home to think again. So the question is then, what comes back? And what I want to ensure, and what we as a, as a party are trying to ensure, is that all guns are blazing in terms of trying to make sure that that decision is reversed uh, by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and that we can convince enough rebels to back the opposition on that. And what I would, want very, what, what I would hope very clearly for is that the Labour Party will be absolutely 100% opposing that in Westminster alongside the SNP and hopefully attracting rebels in order to ensure that we don't have to look further at this matter. But I'll take the member's point. Joanne Lamott. Um, what I take from what the member is saying is it's now an issue of timing. And then, of course, on this side, we want to do everything we can to stop these cuts going through. But would it not be reasonable to ask the Scottish Government, with all the power that it has, all the support that it has, to interrogate every option open to them in order to protect people, rather than spending the last few days explaining to everybody how they can't do anything to support these families? Mark MacDonald. But the, the, the Cabinet Secretary, I think, stated quite clearly in his speech that, that is exactly what the government is doing and what the government will do is to look at what it can, uh, is to look at what it can do and how it can deliver uh, support for the most vulnerable. The next point is around the, the vehicle for delivery. And the vehicle for delivery is important. In order to uh, offset the bedroom tax, we were able to use discretionary housing payments. It required permissions in terms of the lifting of the cap in order for it to be able to be done, and that required negotiation with Westminster. In terms of council tax benefit, of course, we had to create a mechanism to ensure that the 10% reduction could be replaced uh, in order to fully fund council tax reduction uh, with the monies that were given to us. So again, there had to be some creative thinking applied in order to enable that to happen. But we took evidence at the Finance Committee last week from HMRC around the Scottish Rate of Income Tax. And what HMRC said was that if the Scottish Rate of Income Tax were set differently 
as opposed to a UK level, it would more than double the administration costs the HMRC would incur. Now, if we are to uh, be looking at the possibility of establishing a different approach in Scotland, and given the HMR, the, the, the current, there is a cost per transaction in terms of tax credits, as opposed to a global administrative sum, which there is for Scottish rate of income tax, that then begs a question of where the administration costs for that will fall, and whether those are factored into the calculations which were laid out by Jackie Bailey. But the, you know, nobody, nobody here shies away from or doesn't recognise the reality of the impact on the vulnerable in society. But our record, whether it's on the establishment of the welfare fund, whether it's on council tax reduction, whether it's on housing, uh, the, house, the, the discretionary housing payments, shows that where we can, we do take action to support the most vulnerable in society. But devolution is supposed to be about our priorities and setting our own policy agenda. It shouldn't be about a case of continually being handed a, a pig's ear by Westminster and being expected on limited resources to fashion it into a silk purse.